All right, we finally made it to the end of this journey through statistics. Chapter 12 is going to be more about regression. We're going to look at running significance tests and confidence intervals for the slope of regression lines. And we're going to learn about what if data is not linear, can we still do linear regression? Or we'll learn methods of, of finding models that aren't necessarily linear as what we did in chapter three. So we come up with a, a regression equation in chapter three, something like y hat equals b sub naught plus b sub one times x. Um, we'd find a prediction line. Now we're going to run tests about the slope of those prediction lines or those LSRL, least square regression lines. So we're going to be finding confidence intervals for the true slope of all of the data in the world. And we're, we're going to be running significance tests to determine is there truly a slope that's worthwhile? Does this really make sense for us to use to make predictions? So that's going to be the first task as we move through chapter 12. And then the second half, we'll look at how do we deal with data that's not necessarily linear. So here we go. The population regression line and the sample regression line. Well, we're used to the looking at the sample regression line is what we've done previously. We found a line that fit the sample set of data. So we use this formula y hat equals b sub naught plus b sub one times x, where b sub zero is the y intercept and b sub one is the slope. Okay. Now, what we're going to try to find out is what is the true mean regression line. So if we took uh, sample every possible data set that we could find within this population, what would the true model be? So that's where we, we're going to looking at the top where it says the population regression line. Mu sub y equals beta sub naught plus beta sub one times x. So this here would be the true mean regression line or the equation of the entire population. Okay. So what is mu sub y? Mu sub y, mu sub y, what is mu sub y? Mu sub y is the mean y value for a given value of x. So if we could take every single data point there is, if we could take the entire population, mu sub y is the y value for, the, for any specific given x. It's the mean of all the y values when that one x is given. B sub zero is the intercept of the entire population. It's the true intercept if we had all the data, and B sub one is the true slope. Now we have a regression line that we calculate from a sample. So you can kind of think of this top one up here as uh, being a parameter where this is the statistic. This comes from the entire population and this comes from the sample. So parameter statistic. We, we know that y hat is the estimated mean y value for a given value of x. And b sub zero is the sample y intercept and b sub one is the sample slope. So all of this is we're familiar with from unit three, it's the sample. What we're gonna be trying to do now is use this sample to answer a question about the entire population. That's what inference is, taking a small sample to answer a question about the entire population. So that's gonna be our goal as we're moving forward here. Let's take a look at some, some graphs and stuff here that might help simplify what it is that we're trying to do. So this is all from an example where they wanted to see if they could predict the interval until the next eruption if they knew how long the previous eruption is. So they looked at Old Faithful and they gathered data on the eruptions of this geyser in Yellowstone National Park, Old Faithful. Could I make a prediction for how long or for when the next one's going to happen if I know how long the last one is? So they're using the duration as their explanatory variable 
and they're using the interval until the next eruption as their response variable. So does the duration of this eruption of Old Faithful predict when the next one will happen? That's what they were trying to do. So they gathered some data and they came up with a regression model. And the first time they did it, they got y hat equals 44 plus 10x. So what are they saying? That for every minute in duration, we predict that the interval until the next eruption will increase by 10 minutes. They did it again. They gathered another set of data, and guess what? They did not get the same regression line. Well, sampling variability. From one sample to the next, we're certainly going to get different values. So this one came up with 39 plus point plus 12.5x. They did another sample, and they got y hat equals 24 plus 15.7x. What does the sampling distribution look like? If they simulated this slope, and they did this over and over and over and over again, they simulated to, to find B sub 1, and they graphed all of those slopes, check out what it looks like. Wow, we've seen that picture before. It looks like a normal curve. No real surprises there. This regression line had a thousand simulations of SRSs of size 15. So they gathered 15 data points and they did that a thousand times and they graphed the data. And it turned out to look relatively normal. And that's going to be one of the conditions for inference here. Right? That shouldn't surprise us at all. And if we recall way back when, how do we assess normality? Well, how do we check to see if the data is really normal? Well, one way to check that is by making a normal probability plot. This normal probability plot says if the normal probability plot is roughly linear, then the data is roughly normal. So these thousand samples, they graphed all of them using the normal probability plot. Remember, we don't have to know how the normal probability plot is made, we have to know how to read it. And if it's approximately linear, then the data is approximately normal. <clears throat> Which you can see in the graph here on the right, that yeah, this data looks to be approximately normal. What we're used to seeing, our normal curve. Okay. So that's really what's happening. We wanna take these samples that we did, and we wanna estimate the true slope of the line not these sample slopes that we found. So we're gonna make a confidence interval to determine what is the true slope of this line if we were to find every single data point in the world. Well, obviously, Old, or old Faithful has been erupting for thousands of years or tens of thousands of years, I don't know, but there's no way we could gather all the data for all the eruptions, their length and how long it took for the next eruption to happen. There's no way. But we, what we're trying to do is answer that true question that we could never find out on our own based off of samples that we're taking. That's the whole idea of inference. That's what we're looking at here. So what is the sampling distribution of the slope? Here's another one of these blood-filled pages here. Um, so we have to choose an SRS of N observations. So one point is x comma y. Right? Remember now that we're graphing on the coordinate plane. Now what we see here is that the mean of y is equal to beta sub 0 plus beta sub 1x. This is the true one for the entire population. We don't know what that is, but we're going to try to estimate that what that is. Okay. So what is the sampling distribution of the slope? Well, <clears throat> what is the mean of B1? So if I could take every single slope I could possibly make and find the mean of all of them, guess what? I get the true mean of the entire population. So the mean of B1 is B. So the mean of B sub 1. The mean of all the slopes gives me the true slope. Shouldn't be too surprising. The standard deviation. Remember, we can only use the standard deviation formula if the population is at least 10 times the size of the sample. 
So what is the standard deviation of the slope? Well, it's the standard deviation of the entire population divided by the standard deviation of X times the square root of N. Now, this one's weird. We haven't seen anything that looked like this before. So pay close attention to that formula there. So the sampling distribution of B1 will be approximately normal if the values of the response variable Y follow a normal distribution for each value of the explanatory variable X. What in the world are they saying there? That's a mouthful. So we're going to try to model that for you and show you what it is that this normality condition is saying. Is it normal? Well, it's normal if the values of the response variable Y follow a normal distribution, such as in this example here. So the normal probability plot, by plotting all these there by this normal probability plot, and then by plotting all of these slopes, we can see that the data is approximately normal. So that's what they're telling us in the sampling distribution, when the sampling distribution will be normal. Conditions for regression. You're going to say, dude, I know conditions already. It's the same conditions we do it every single time. It's the same conditions we do. We do random, we do 10%, and we do large counts. Well, now they mess with us. Yeah, there's random. Yeah, uh, there's normality, so to speak, but they don't do it in large counts. And there is the 10% condition. Okay, so this one we're used to. The population must be at least 10 times the size of the sample. Nothing new there. This condition, cool. I'm used to that condition. Okay. Random, cool. I'm used to that condition. Normality, we always did before. For normality, we would use central limit theorem if it was uh, quantitative, or we would use the n times p and n times 1 minus p greater than or equal to 10 if it was categorical. Well, what do we do for the slope of a regression line? So, that's what we were looking at in this previous slide. That's how we're going to test normality. We'll do that in an example here coming up. Okay. Now, there's two new conditions that we haven't talked about previously. Those two new conditions are, is the data truly linear? And are the standard deviations equal each time? So to check this equal standard deviation condition, we're going to look at the residual plot. Remember, residual plot tell, shows us how far away is each observation from the prediction. So look at the residual plot. If distances are approximately the same, then the standard deviations are approximately equal. That's how we check equal standard deviation condition. And then the other one we need to look at is a linear condition. Okay, so this linear condition right here. The actual relationship between X and Y is linear. For any fixed value of X, the mean response, mu sub Y, falls on the population true regression line. Okay. How do we check if it's truly linear? Okay. Well, normal probability plot, I'm sorry, if the residual plot shows no random, let me start over again. If the residual plot shows random scatter, then the data is approximately linear. If there's a pattern in the residual plot, then the data is not linear. So we need to check that condition as well. There's a lot more condition checking here in inference for regression than our previous inference problems. Okay. Well, let's take a look at an example here of this helicopter. Okay. Mr. Barrett's class did a fun experiment using paper helicopters. After making 70 helicopters using the same templates, students randomly assigned 14 helicopters to each of five different drop heights. The team of students released the 70 helicopters in random order and measured the flight times in seconds. The class used computer software to carry out a least square regression analysis for these data. Here are the scatter plot and the residual plot. Our job is to check whether the conditions for performing inference have been met. Okay, well, let's look at those conditions. 
make sure I got the right, okay? The first one was, does the data appear to be linear? Well, the scatter plot shows a clear linear form and there is no leftover curved pattern, okay? So the, the scatter plot shows a clear linear form. The residual plot has random scatter or the scatter plot appears linear. So you can see that, yeah, it looks like there's a linear pattern there. There's no residual curved, leftover curved pattern there. Okay, second, we need to check independence. Let's check independence. Well, we can just talk about what it means to be independent in this situation. Okay, we can just say, well, yeah, for the independence condition, um, individual observations are independent of one another. Or we would have to assume that there were at least 700 drops of these paper helicopters. Or we could just say, yeah, I believe each drop would be independent of the previous drop. So not too hard right now, but it's a lot to remember, okay? And so remember it was linear we checked, independence, now normality. We needed to check, is the data approximately normal? So what we do is we take the residuals and we make a histogram of the residuals. That's what this has been, that's what has been done here. Or we can make a normal probability plot, okay? So the, it appears to be roughly normal because there is no strong skewness in the histogram of the residuals. So the normality condition seems to be seems okay because nothing here it appears to be linear. Yeah, same with the residual plot. Okay. Now, what about equal standard deviations? Equal standard deviations. Well, we can see the standard deviations from the residual plot. The residual plot shows a similar amount of scatter about the line y equals zero for each drop of the height. However, the definitely these distances that each one of these is away from the line is not the same. Okay, so when dropped from whatever it was, like 307 has more variation. It appears that the, that there's roughly the same amount for each one on top and on bottom though. Okay. And then finally, was it random? Yeah. Um, students randomly assigned the helicopters to different heights. You think, whew, we just did the problem. All we did was check the conditions. All we did was the second step. Are we allowed to do the problem? That's what we need to do to check conditions. Very painful, I know. Okay. A lot of work goes into just checking those conditions.